All right, church, happy Sabbath. Today we're going to get started with our Sabbath school lesson for this morning. And uh, before we start, as usual, we'll say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy Sabbath day. We thank you for the fact that you have a desire to be with us and teach us despite our filthy, darkened hearts. I ask that you would open up our minds to the Holy Spirit, that we will be able to receive the teaching that you have for us today. I pray that you will forgive us of our sins and help us to become more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So today's lesson, oh, snap. I just realized I forgot my Sabbath school lesson. Give me one second. I left the book, the booklet in here. Sorry about that. Forgot the booklet. Had all my other stuff. Okay, so today we're going to be going over lesson number 10. And this one is Rule of the Judgment. And we're going to be starting with the first question. And this is, what command is given to God's people with reference to the temple of God and its worshipers? So this is going to come from the book of Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And if we have a reader uh, to go through those two verses with us, that would be wonderful. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and Zechariah chapter 2, verse 2. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar and them that worship therein, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Amen. Zechariah 2. Zechariah 2, 2. Zechariah 2, 2. <clears throat> I also read verse 1. It says, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. Can I also add another text to of that? Uh, Matthew 7. I like Matthew 7 mm -hmm. because it, because it, it uh, shows clearly what measuring is. Mm -hmm. It shows that measuring is connected with judgment. Mm -hmm. So Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Amen. I, I love that you read that because I actually had that written down too. So we're on the same page. Amen. Um, but yes, so the, the question was, what, uh, what command is given to God's people with reference to the temple? And if you look at Revelation 11 verse, uh, verse 1, it talks about measuring the temple of God. And as we looked in the verse from Matthew that the pastor just read, uh, measuring has to do with judgment. And judgment is one of the most important aspects in the Bible. It's, uh, I was reading, um, I believe it was The Cross and Shadow, and it mentioned that uh, the judgment should be something more contemplated than death, is basically what it was saying. And if you really think about it, so many in this world are concerned with just death. They think about funerals, they think about you know, not wanting to go out in a painful way, and there's all these concerns we have. But in reality, the judgment is something that we really need to contemplate on because it depends on everything that we do in this life. Every decision, every thought, every word that we, uh, that we express is going to be a part of that. Uh, there's many verses we can go, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna skip too, too far in the lesson, but I wanna just emphasize the importance of that. Um, now with that, I also want to read this section uh, that explains this a little bit more in detail. This is from Daniel and Revelation. I'm going to read page uh, 532, or at least parts of it from page 532. And it reads, The call to rise and measure the temple of God is a prophetic command to the church to give the subject of the temple or sanctuary a special examination. But how is this to be done with the measuring rod given to the church? With the Ten Commandments alone, we could not do it. When we take the entire message, however, we find ourselves led by it to an examination of the sanctuary on high, 
with the commandments of God and the ministration of Christ. And this is the key part. Hence, we conclude that the measuring rod taken as a whole is the special message now given to the church, which embraces the great truths peculiar to this time, including the Ten Commandments. So I wanted to share that because uh, not only uh, is it talking about the, the measuring, but it's talking about what the standard of that measurement is and uh, the importance of, of the, the reed and the rod in, this, in the temple and what that's talking about. Um, I also want to share this passage from, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a hand over here. Yeah. Um, you share yours and then I'll share mine. <laughs> okay. It might be the same, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, um, I have a commentary in my Bible. Uh, this is from Manuscript 4, written in the year 1888. And it's referring to uh, Revelation 11, verse 1. Uh, and I think it's just some, some thoughts that will help us to contemplate the seriousness of what, uh, what this life contains. And it says, The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, Measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember, when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are tending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. Remember that your words and actions are being daguerreotyped or photographed in the books of heaven as the face is produced by the artist on the polished plate. Here is the work going on, measuring the temple and its worshipers to see who will stand in that last day. Those who stand fast shall have an abundant entrance to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we are doing our work Remember, there is one that is watching the spirit in which we are doing it. Shall we not bring the Savior into our everyday lives, into our secular work and domestic duties? And then in the name of God, we want to leave behind everything that is not necessary, all gossiping or unprofitable visiting, and present ourselves as servants of the living God. So I, I share that because uh, we, we should be we should develop a habit of bringing God to every aspect of the life, and it's super important. Can you give me that reference again? That was Manuscript 4, written in the year 1888. Manuscript 4? Mm -hmm. 1888? Correct. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so I was, I was um, gonna go to Ezekiel, because in Ezekiel, really from chapter 40 all the way to 48, you basically have um, a vision of the temple. And this temple was never really built on earth because God's people weren't faithful, but it actually is a prophecy about New Jerusalem, right? The temple that would be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so, but just looking here in Ezekiel 40, really briefly, and then going to 43, uh, Ezekiel 40, you actually see the same illustrations of what we saw in Revelation 11 and Zechariah 2. Ezekiel 40 verse 3, and he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, and a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate, and the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, set thine heart upon all that I will show thee for, to the intent that I might show them unto the art thou brought hither declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. And of course, this man <clears throat> of brass with, with the measuring line is, is, is a symbol of Christ. Um, just like in Revelation uh, 10, you know, he got the, the measuring read from the angel um, in chapter 10, which is Christ. But, but specifically now, with that, with that being said, chapter 43, and this is the connection that I wanted to make with the sanctuary in particular, because you were talking about how the people of God had to measure the temple, measure the sanctuary. Of course, there's a dual application with the church. There's judgment going on with the church, right? After the great disappointment in chapter 10, 1844 in the, in the autumn, but it's also a call to measure the heavenly sanctuary, right? To, to study that out as well, because that's gonna be the key to the disappointment. So chapter 43 of, of um, Ezekiel in verse nine, and of course, he's still measuring, Christ is measuring, and he's telling the prophet to look at everything that he's showing him, right? Verse nine says, now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. 
thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. And we know God said, let them make me a a sanctuary that might dwell among them according to the pattern that I showed thee, right? That was the heavenly. Verse 11 says, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the coming in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and, and the laws thereof. Write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and to do them. This is the law of the house upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. So interesting that when you begin to start measuring the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, you become ashamed of your iniquities. And then the law is brought to the forefront. And this is the reason why the Sabbath now in context of the third angel is gonna become present truth. It wasn't until they started studying the sanctuary, right, and then understanding the law of God that they would be able to be, to, to, to be able to prophesy again, mm -hmm. right, and to, and to explain why Jesus didn't come back to the earth Amen. in 1844, because you had the work of the third angel, the work of the investigative judgment, the commands of God and the faith of Jesus, and, and the warning of the third angel that would have to go to the world prior to Jesus coming back. Amen, amen. Yeah, there's something that you, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, I didn't mean to <laughs> cut off your thought. No, 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 it's fine. But uh, I, I also just wanted to add to what's everything that's being said. Um, you mentioned earlier how um, in the quote it was mentioned that we should carry Jesus with us throughout our everyday lives or have him there uh, in everything we do and all the aspects of our life. And I've uh, just recently, um, I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, um, every time I'm dealing with someone, I get, the Holy Spirit tells me, make sure that's not Jesus. Or basically, was that Jesus? Did you speak correctly? Did you, whatever you said, you can't take back now. So make sure that wasn't Jesus. Or before you talk to someone, be sure that that's not Jesus. Um, and our, my dealings with people as well. Um, but I wanted to also read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, in verse 8, um, discussing the foundation, which I think also ties into measuring uh, ourselves and making sure that we are hewed and squared. Verse 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, For we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation in another building thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Uh, that, that goes to what the comment I just made. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And you can also um, add to that, no man can measure, because Jesus Christ is the man that laid the foundation, therefore he's the man that measured the foundation. Uh, we will have our day when we will be measuring uh, in the thousand year millennial period, but it goes on in verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, which is interesting, the different resources and materials it gives, not only faith, not only the word of God, but other things. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's another measuring, uh, believe it or not, that's um, God take into account what everyone's work is or, or how they laid their foundations or how Christ laid the foundation in them. Uh, verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward, reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that which will be measured it says, um, and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So just adding to what's been said as far as the foundation, the temple being measured, uh, us being hewed and squared. And this also goes back to the, the wedding uh, parable, which we had our Sabbath school lesson on a few uh, Sabbaths back, but everything ties together. It's, uh, it's the same concept as the will within the will. And you know what's also amazing is the universe also shares that same concept, the will within the will. I've seen something on YouTube where the earth is revolving around this, and this is revolving around that, and the sun is, re- it's, it's the same concept, the will within the will. Wow, amen. Thank you for all of that. And one thing I really liked about, especially when you were sharing 1 Corinthians, it talks about um, the worshipers, the, us being the temple of God. And that's one of the key things at the end of Revelation 11, verse 1, where it talks about um, them that worship therein. So not only are you measuring the, the heavenly temple or that, that temple, but you're talking about us as worshipers. What are we doing? Um, and I also wanted to go to a verse um, in Psalm 119. Uh, verse 96, talking about the law of God and how, um, you know, we can, uh, there's, there's always more to, more growth that we, that can be had. Um, so Psalm 119, verse 96 says, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. And I think Jesus is the best person to bring this out. When he was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, he would often make things, quote unquote, more difficult <laughs> when you really think about it. Um, Cause he said, you know, you've heard it was said uh, to uh, that not to, I, I, and let's just go there. Cause that verse is slipping my mind. I don't want to misquote it. Let's just go to Matthew 5, 48. Matthew 5, um, is it 48 or no 20, I'm sorry. Um, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. But the commandment in verse 27 says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So you've seen this commandment, but now I'm going to make it a little bit more deep for you so that it's not just the, the actions that we're talking about. It's the heart. It's what's in the mind. Uh, he applies the same logic a uh, couple of verses uh, surrounding it when he talks about anger, when he talks about um, having a desire to uh, or let's just read verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Um, then, what's the other verse I'm thinking of? 33. 33, is that what it is? Ah, thank you. Um, again, ye have heard that have been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Uh, by saying to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. So, uh, I bring this up because it often it often seems that the law is exceeding broad. There's more to it than meets the eye. And for those who say that they've made it and have not been translated to heaven, you could probably imagine there's still some more work that needs to be done there. Um, all right, let's go to question number two. This one is, besides God's people, who has a measuring line? Where does he place it? And what does he say he will not do? So this comes from the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Do we have a reader for that? Amos, chapter 7. Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall and made, stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Amen. All right, so first off, does anyone not know what a plumb line is? No, everyone seems to know? Okay, for those, oh, go ahead. No, okay, so just for those who do not know or may be watching online, a plumb line is essentially a weight held on the bottom of a string. The idea was that uh, the weight would cause the line to be perfectly straight, and it was often used in building, sort of like a level. And so when we see this vision of the plumb line, we read again uh, verse 8. Uh, in the middle of it says, I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. So what he's saying is 
Go ahead. Lazarus. No, finish your thought. Oh, <laughs> what he's saying is there is a uh, there's a way I want to s- that I want them to be. I'm measuring them against this plumb line, right. and if they don't line up, if they don't match up, then there's going to be a problem. Yeah. So go ahead, Pastor. I was just going to say that in in this, but well, actually in Amos, there's um, there's four visions, mm-hmm. chapter seven and chapter eight. There's two visions that come before this. One of the grasshoppers. Um, other a fire, and you can see that under those two visions, probation is still open. There's still a chance for God's people to be sealed, as it were. But when you look in verse eight and seven to nine, it's clear that when he says, I'm not gonna pass by them anymore, and he talks about in verse nine, the high places of Isaac being desolate, the sanctuaries of Israel uh, being laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword, that this is actually a symbol of the closed probation. And the reason why you know this, well, we'll look at it in the next question, the fourth vision, but let me just go to um, the book of Micah 7, because he says, I'm not passing by. And so what does it mean when he says, I'm not passing by the house of Israel any longer? I'm looking at Micah chapter uh, 7 and looking here in verse 18. Micah chapter 7 and verse 18, again, I will not, I, when you see that plumb line, again, it's a symbol of measuring, symbol of judgment, um, but at this point, under the third vision of Amos, the third message, there's going to be a, a shut door. Well, now, when we look at Micah seven eighteen, it says, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retained it not his anger forever because he delighted in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So in other words, in verse 18, when he's passing by his people, it means he's still forgiving them. He's still pardoning them. He's still being compassionate to them. He still is working to conquer their iniquities. But when he says, I'm not passing by anymore, that's the equivalent to him standing up. That's the equivalent of probation closing, no more mercy, no more forgiveness, uh, no more opportunity, as it were, to um, sin your sins before end of judgment that they can be blotted out. So I just wanted to, to just plug that in. When it says he's not passing by anymore, that means no more opportunity right. to receive um, forgiveness, repentance, and salvation from our sins. Amen. Amen. Uh, you have another comment? Oh, no, go ahead. No? Okay. So one thing also I wanted to bring up, when you think about the description of the plumb line, I talked about it being a straight line, and it made me think of a few verses in Matthew. First off, I want to go to the book of Matthew chapter 3 uh, and verse 3, and this is speaking of John the Baptist. Uh, Actually, I'll just start Matthew 3, verse 1. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. In other words, uh, there's that narrow pathway. And uh, just to emphasize that again, let's go to Matthew 7, 14. Speaking of that narrow way, Matthew 7, 14, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And actually, I'll start in verse 13, where Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So, in other words, what he's saying is that pathway, that, uh, that journey to salvation is a very uh, narrow margin. There's a lot of ways to be able to divert and uh, be found in error. But if you want to be able to uh, have God recognize you as one of his own, you have to take part in that straight pathway. Amen. Um, and also dealing with the making the path straight, God often says, turn not to the left or to the right. Um, and if you consider him measuring you, altering the, the path can mess up the measurement. Mm-hmm. So uh, I wanted to go to Amos chapter 8 just to deal with the same, same thing we're discussing in a different, uh, mentioned in a different way. 
Amos chapter 8, verse 1, this is dealing with the summer fruit. Uh, it says in verse 1 of Amos chapter 8, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Same language that was uh, mentioned uh, in the uh, earlier chapter or in the, the later chapter of Amos. But he, he uses summer fruit as the, as the, I guess, description, you can say, for him not passing by his people anymore. And there's a lot of things you can pull from that verse because summer is, that's a very, 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 it's a very, very uh, scary subject when God talks about the summer. Uh, and I wanted to go to another verse just to show that in verse 24 of Matthew, Matthew 24. Because it's dealing with the same thing, measurement and judgment, as our pastor Taylor just mentioned. Uh, judgment, him not passing by his church anymore, him letting them know this is the warning, I'm, this is it. This is your last chance. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 32, it is uh, the parable of the fig tree. It says in verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Interesting enough, both of these are dealing with fruits. It says, when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So again, just dealing with judgment, uh, God mentioning to his people, I will not pass by again. Uh, you uh, see that summer is nice. And um, also farmers, they measure fruit. Believe it or not, they measure their fruits and make sh to make sure if it's good, if it's not good. Uh, they also look at it uh, and, you know, uh, observe the marks or the scratches or the tears or the openings in the fruit. So everything ties together uh, when it is in regard to measuring and uh, the, the summer fruit. And I think it's a beautiful picture that God is showing. Amen. I was just going to uh, confirm with uh, Brother White what he was sharing in Matthew 24 and also Amos um, 8. Um, talking about how summer could be scary. When you look at um, Jeremiah 8.20, um, Jeremiah 8.20, it says here, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So this is just another text to show that basically when summertime comes and harvest comes, because it's been picked, it's been harvested, the wheat and the tear have been separated, right? So either we are with the we are not saved, the terror, or we are saved with the we. Amen. Amen. You know, tangentially, I just, I think about what I associate summer with. Um, and I think about when I was a kid and we would get summer breaks and we would always, you know, play outside or in my case, lots of video games. Um, and I think about all the time that technically was wasted on things that were not useful. And I think about the time that we're living in and how we are identified as a church of Laodicea, and there's often a lot of things that, um, that we struggle with that we ought not to struggle with this quite the same way. We, we deal with things uh, that uh, don't really matter in the long run, and uh, I, don't know, just, I don't know if I have a full thought about that just yet. It just crossed my mind as something that was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but thank you all for your comments. Um, we actually did answer question number three. That one was, what time is reached when the Lord says, I will not pass by them anymore? That was from Amos, two, uh, Amos 8, verses 2 and 3 that Brother White just read. Um, and that's essentially the, the judgment. Mm -hmm. Let's go to question four. Uh, what is this plummet by which God's people are measured? And this is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 17. Um, Isaiah 28, 17, I'll read that. if the pages separate properly. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. 
and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And in the question, it also says, one translation reads, I made judgment for a line and righteousness for a plummet. So, uh, so again, the question is, what is this plummet by which God's people are measured? Uh, well, I won't deal with the righteousness part because that's coming up. Right. That's in the next question, so I'm not going to touch that. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is verse 18, notice what happens um, because God is going to sweep away the ref refuge of lies. In other words, the, the, the structure, you know, that they've trusted in is going to be swept away by storm and tempest. You know, we've read that, that particular statement regarding the uh, mark of the beast crisis. Well, verse 18, it says, Your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. So this covenant with death and agreement with hell is really talking about being aligned with the powers of spiritualism and also the Antichrist at the end of time. And one of the ways that you align with that is by receiving the mark in your right hand or forehead. But notice what happens here as God is using this righteous, this righteous plumb line, this, this standard to measure his people, which of course, when, when you use that measuring line, it reveals all lies, it reveals all falsehood, it, ex it exposes all these, these things. But verse 18 says, continuing, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, ye shall be trodden down by it. And when you take the time to study overflowing scourge, it's really talking about the Sunday law crisis. It's talking about the mark of the beast crisis that's going to uh, come through and sweep away all systems of falsehood, all systems of spiritualism, all systems of, of antichrist, things that God's people are using to hide under, um, even now, are all going to be swept away when that overflowing scourge comes through. So I just wanted to touch on that, and we'll deal with um, the righteous plumb line in, in just a minute. Oh, I can see you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate the answer. Um, all right, let's go to question number five. What is righteousness? And we're going to read from Psalm 119, verse 172. Someone want to read that? Psalms 119, 172. It's, it reads, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. All thy commandments are righteousness. So there's a lot of other verses that sound rather similar. Um, we can go through a couple of them. One I have is uh, Psalm 97 verse 2. So we can go there for a moment. Psalm 97 verse 2, which reads, clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. So we see God characterized with righteousness and judgment. Um, another verse uh, we can go to uh, let's go to, I think, Titus. Let's go to Titus. I just want to make sure this is the right one. Didn't write this down incorrectly. Um, yes, okay. It's Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Um, this, is, this one says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Mm. So part of the righteousness aspect is denying, uh, uh, talking about self-denial, that's part of, uh, of the whole mission or the whole journey as a Christian. Um, and then let's go to Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. Matthew chapter 21. Verses 28 through 32. Um, and this one is the parable of the two sons. And it says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them... Twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Mm. 
for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So again, this is uh, speaking about uh, what it is that we do. That is a big part of it. It's not just, uh, it's not just saying things. There's a, there's a phrase that the world likes to say, and it's uh, talk is cheap. Amen. And uh, when, when you get down to it, a lot of the Bible basically shares that same sentiment. Don't just talk about it, be about it. Live the life that God calls you to live. Um, okay. Were there any other comments? No, no? Okay. Let's go to question number six. And this is, by what standard is the world to be measured or judged? And this first passage is from James chapter 2, verse 12. I'll read that, and then someone can turn to Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. So I'll read in James chapter 2, verse 12, and that says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Amen. So again, talking about the, the law, which we've read is, uh, is righteousness, is just, is holy. There's so many passages that describe what the law is. And in this case, it's called the law of liberty, the law of uh, freedom in a lot Amen. of ways. Um, and then Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Does someone have that? Yeah, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, uh, 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. If I can make a comment about yeah. that, that's, that's sobering because when you take a look at when you do things, different things in the dark, um, if you understand that, you won't approach things that way. You'll make sure that, okay, well, Lord, this is some of the things that I'm dealing with, I'm struggling with, and I need your power to give me victory over that. Because if somebody that doesn't understand it, they're just going to keep on doing things and think they're getting away with different things. And at the end of the day, um, it's all being recorded. So that's sobering to see that. We just especially as Christians, I mean, we, but a lot of us, because we believe that, well, you know, hey, I'm, I might get away with this deal, or I might do this and do that. It's being recorded. You're not getting away from anything. You can't hide anything from God. Amen. Amen. One, one thing I really like to think about whenever I read Ecclesiastes is the context. We talk a lot about making sure we read and understand things in context, and there's no way we can read the entire Bible every single time we do uh, go to church, but there's a lot of lessons we can pull from one or two verses here and there. But Ecclesiastes, as you guys know, was written by King Solomon. When you think about Solomon, who he was, and what he did, there's a lot that really comes to my mind, uh, especially with the fact that those verses we read are the very end of Ecclesiastes. First off, he was a king. He had access to way more than any of us could ever imagine. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think two or one or two of the uh, seven ancient wonders of the world were in uh, his kingdom. He was worth about four trillion dollars. If you uh, map it out for today's standards, makes Elon Lust's fortune look like lunch money to him. Um, and he goes on through the whole book saying, yeah, I've had men singers, women singers, I've had this many wives, I've had these experiences. And at the end of all that, none of that makes me happy. Therefore, the conclusion of it is keep fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. And when you think about a life that was lived in such a way, and that's the final thing he says, that's like his deathbed confession, in a sense. Amen. So the last things that he says are incredibly important for us to understand, um, and that's what he basically summed up life as in these two verses. Uh, just real quick, I, I like what you, just, what you just said because it ties back to the, uh, the text that you read in Matthew 21, how the son, the son that repented just like Solomon at the end of his life, he did those things and he kind of looked back over his life and how um, he gave his life to Christ. And it, and it does speak to no matter what we do, we have an advocate with the Father. And if we, uh, we fall, we get up, we go to Christ and he'll forgive us if we're sincere about it. And that's Solomon if we, when you take a look at his, the totality of his whole entire life. Amen. 
you have a comment? Yes, stand back. No? Okay. Let's go to the next question here. This one is question number seven. Um, what did the Savior say would judge unbelievers? This comes from John chapter 12, verse 48. John chapter 12, verse 48. Let me get there. Okay. John chapter 12, verse 48. Mm hmm Bible says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth, judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Amen. So the question again is, by what are we judged? Answer. His words. His words, yes, his words. Um, one of the verses that always struck me as very peculiar uh, and in the best way is when he says uh, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And I know I've said this before in a Sabbath school lesson probably some months ago, but I think about how rare of a sentence that actually is. But like, I would not be willing to say that about anything I've ever said. Most of us don't even remember what the other person said 20 minutes ago um, or uh, an hour ago or 10 years ago. But now you have this this preacher who at the time was not very well liked by the Pharisees. He was, <laughs> he was causing quite some trouble with them. And he said, my words will not pass away. And we're still talking about that 2,000 years later. Um, and this is before his resurrection. So the power of what he's saying um, and just that phrase, my word shall not pass away, really speaks volumes when we read the passage that Brother White just mentioned about his words being I guess the, the standard of judgment for us in the last days. So it's very sobering, very, um, very serious to think about. Um, any comments? No? Okay. All right, um, let's go to question number eight. What rule does the psalmist say the Lord will use in judgment? This is from Psalm 96, verse 13. Psalm 96, 13, if I can have a reader for that. Psalms 96 and verse number 13. <clears throat> it says, Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Amen. Amen. So the when we talk about the truth, I think this verse is coming up um, actually in the next question, but when Jesus says things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then he says, you'll also be judged by the words that I say. He'll also be judged by the commandments that I've given. Like, it all comes together in a very uh, simple picture, if you really think about it. There's, and when I say simple, it's exceedingly simple, just like the verse in Psalms, because there's so much to it, obviously, but it is in concept, not that difficult to understand. Um, yes. Make a comment here. If I could also turn to Psalm 43, mm -hmm. because again, as we've been showing, everything ties back to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We connect that with Psalm 77, 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, O God, is in the sanctuary. Truth, O God, is in the sanctuary. Thy law, O God, thy commandments, O God, thy righteousness, O God, is in the sanctuary. Everything refers back. So when we look at Psalm 43, this is a very interesting text, uh, beginning here in verse 3, Psalm 43, verse 3. It says, O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Of course, Holy Hill tabernacles can be associated or interchanged with Zion or with the sanctuary, either or, depending on the context. But I find it interesting that the psalmist says, send your light and your truth. Why doesn't he just say, send your truth? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many claiming to have the truth, but without the light, you don't even know if it's truth, right? Because when you shed the light on it, which is the, the, the Bible or the law, and that's the measuring guide, right, that we've been talking about. When you send out the light and then you use the light to search for truth, then you know 
that you're not going to be in darkness or error. If you just send out truth, well, anybody can claim to have truth. But he says, send your light and your truth. And he says, let them lead me. And where are they going to lead us? Right back to the sanctuary or to the people who know about the sanctuary, the people of the third angel. So I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Oh, just real quick, I like what Pastor said about if you take a look at John 14:6, uh, when you talk about Christ being the way, the truth, and the light, you tie the like he said earlier, you tie uh, the way with the courtyard, you tie the truth with the holy place. Uh, that's sanctification, sanctify, sanctif sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, and then you have the life which is glorification. So it all runs back to the sanctuary. And um, that's what's so beautiful about this, the sanctuary service, because everything runs right back to it. Amen, amen. All right, great. Anyone else have comments? No? Okay. Let's move to, what are we on, question nine, I believe? Um, question nine, what is truth? Um, Psalm 119, 142, um, and then John 14, 6, which we had just read, but I'll just stick with Psalms for now. Psalm 119, 142, and that verse says, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So again, everything is just coming back to that one location of the sanctuary being the central part of uh, where God communicates truth to us, and he reveals the light to us as well. Um, let's see. John fourteen six. Yes, John fourteen six. Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen, amen. And what I find interesting about this too um, is he himself, as an individual, is identifying himself with truth. I, it's a it's a very strange thing for for me to say I am truth. That's very weird to say, but when he is talking about it, it's very different. Um, and I, don't know, I try and think of verses in that sense, like the things that Jesus says, would I be capable of saying that and being honest with myself? And for me, it helps me to, I guess, it, uh, enlighten some of the words that, that Jesus spoke because he is a very unique individual for many reasons. All right, let's go to question number 10. This one is, is it possible to attain to this standard? This comes from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 13. I actually want to read verses 12 and 13 for this scenario. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 um, it says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure, there's that word again, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So essentially, what he's saying here is that we have the ability to reach this standard. Uh, and when he says the word till, like till we reach this, uh, this place, uh, this is the goal here. So we need to reach that perfection that Christ had. Um, you can also stay in Ephesians. Let's go to chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Does someone want to read that for us? Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Amen. So again, this again emphasizes that, again, the question being, is it possible to attain the standard? It must be, because Jesus is far too valuable to do something that is just wasteful. And even if, uh, if not as many would be saved as he would like, he still did that because he sees us as valuable. Um, I also want to go to another passage from Matthew 13 to emphasize this point even more. Matthew 13, verse 24. 
And this is another parable of Christ. And it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then go, that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, I'm sure there's probably um, five sermons we could pull out of this, but, uh, but essentially what it's saying is there's two groups. Jesus often talks about there being two groups, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the, uh, the righteous and the unrighteous. And he would not do that if there, it wasn't possible for righteousness to come about uh, as a result of our walk on this earth. Otherwise, why waste time? If he knew we were all just going to, uh, going to be part of the goats or part of the, uh, the tares, then he wouldn't have spent his time telling us that we don't have to end up that way. Uh, comment? Yes. Actually, I just wanted to mention, um, just thinking about uh, us reaching the standard, um, for many it's an impossible feat. But, you know, the promises that are given is so, they should be so dear to us because it is an impossible feat without God. Without God, it's impossible. And just to know that we have someone on our side to make it possible is to mean everything to us. And I was thinking about in my mind as you were sharing that um, reaching the standard and the possibility of reaching the standard being sinless, I was thinking about uh, the miraculous conception of John himself uh, in Luke chapter 1. And I just wanted to read it. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, uh, then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Uh, and that, in a nutshell, is how we can reach the standard. The Holy Ghost will come upon us, and the Holy Ghost will overshadow us, our, our worldly selves. It goes on to say, uh, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. So just from that, just seeing that, Elizabeth was called barren, Right? Uh, she was unable to conceive, or she probably was, but in her old age, you know, it's, it's, it's far-fetched now. You're old. But God can bring from the pit life from someone who was not able to bring life within herself, right? Her own uh, methods, her and her husband. They're not able to do it, but God can do it without, you know, we, uh, we always limit God is what I, I often think about. We limit him because of our worldly minds, our worldly understanding. Um, as the Bible just said, nothing shall be impossible. So God can bring from nothing something. And not only that, John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit. So how can God make from someone who's not able to give birth give birth and the spirit is with their child at the same time before he even comes out. It's uh, simply amazing just to consider. And I think it should be also encouraging for us to know that, um, you know, we, we often go to God in prayer, you know, our father in heaven, but we have to literally consider him as our father. Uh, the Bible mentions how your parents uh, your parents wouldn't give you something evil, but how much more will your father give you the Holy Spirit, who's the person who's going to make us or help us to reach that standard 
Uh, so I think we need to be encouraged just that God is willing to help us reach this standard. Amen. Amen. And I, you know, I, I think about how when Jesus came, I think probably one of the biggest reasons I can sum it up, if, if I could sum it up in one word, the reason was compassion. Uh, he had compassion on humanity. He knew that we couldn't do it. He, and he said, you know what, I'm going to show you an example. And, um, you know, just tangentially, one of the things that I find funny with um, atheists, sometimes they'll say, well, why doesn't God just come here himself and show us how it's done? I'm like, well, what would you expect him to do? And they might say things like, oh, he probably heal a lot of people. He probably do things that were seemingly impossible. I'm like, yeah, we, we, we had that. <laughs> we had that. Pretty good example. It's very well documented, by the way. Um, but yes, you're right. It should be a source of encouragement for us because Jesus did many things that seemed impossible. Um, he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He walked on water. He caused the storm to, uh, to cease with a few words. Um, all of that just shows divine power. And if he's able to do those things with nature, how much more can he do those things with us? And he cares more about us than I'm sure he does rain or uh, even the birds of the air that he, uh, that he talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. All right. Um, any other comments? Yes. The comment that you just made about um, what you hear from atheists sometimes, mm -hmm. well, it kind of made me laugh a little because he did come. And, and, to, and to, to show us how it's done. And he ended up on the cross. So anyway, I, 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 it kind of made me chuckle a little because he did do what they said he should do, and they put him on the cross. Amen. All right, let's go to, uh, oh, one of the other verses I forgot to read here. This is from Jude one twenty four. Again, part of the question, is it possible to attain the standard? And the verse reads, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Um, and I, you know, as I was reading this and, and studying it and versus how I'm reading it now, I missed the part where it says with exceeding joy, as in he delights in presenting us faultless. So the fact that he not only came down to die for us, but he did this with, with exceeding joy, knowing what the end result would be, being reunited with us for all eternity, um, is, is such an amazing thought. And I think that we can also keep that in our minds as we're studying and going through this Christian walk because he did it all for us. Um, all right, then the final question, unless there are any other comments, this is, what will be the character of those who are redeemed from the earth when Christ comes? And we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14, verses 3 through 5. Revelation 14, verses 3 through 5. Uh, and this is in the section of the 144,000, but verse 3 reads, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144 thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are, were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. There's that phrase again, faultless, without fault. We just read that in Jude. And again, if we just go through just some of those, uh, those characteristics of those who are redeemed. It mentioned being not, not defiled with women or false uh, churches or doctrines, following the lamb wherever he goes, being redeemed, being the first fruits, um, being, uh, having no guile or basically being truth tellers, and also without fault. In order to have those characteristics, though, we have to be um, al aligned with that plumb line. We have to make sure that we are overcoming sin. We have to make sure that we are uh, aligning with Christ as much as possible, for straight is the way. And, uh, and also to be encouraged, be reminded that he does this with exceeding joy, helping us to attain salvation. So uh, is there any other comments? Going once, going twice? No? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all so much for your participation in this study. I pray that it has been a blessing for you. Um, and I'm going to pray before 
Brother Vane passes out the Sabbath school offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us about your judgment. We recognize that the way is very straight, the way is very narrow, but you also want to know that you are providing help for us by your Holy Spirit and through your Son with exceeding joy. We thank you for the fact that not only do you desire to save us, you provide us with very clear instructions on how to obtain that salvation. We thank you for all the things that you've had to do to align our lives to this point, to teach us the truth that we have at this hour. We pray that you will help us to teach it to others and to live by it as well. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Please be with us the rest of the service. I pray that our worship will be delightful in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.